Good morning and welcome to Waterloo. We're here at the World Junior Ultimate Championships of 2018 here on the showcase field at Rim Park brought to you by Cut Camps. On the field today we have the Japanese men taking on the Australian men in an exciting game in the first round of the men's division of this tournament. I'm Naomi Redmond. I'm joined today by Tushar Singh uh, and we are excited for this first pull. Starting off, we have Japan on defense and Australia is going to collect to the middle. Japan putting on a quick zone here, three-man cup. Australia moving it back and forth. Out to the sideline, looking to the middle and a nice OI flick out to, this, out to the middle. That's number one, Seth Lovell. And all the way to the other sideline, can he keep it in? And he does. That's number 10, Angus Wicks. Putting out another blading flick, but it's a little bit out of the hands of number 31. That's Pat Graham. Australia is going to have to turn around and play defense here on Japan. Tushar, what do you think about that, that zone that Japan put out on Australia? It was a great standard uh, cup to come out with to really put the pressure on the handlers, break up any sort of set play they might have had. It's a good start. Japan puts out a flick huck right away out into space. Looking out at the end zone, that's number 55, Yuito Nag Nagagawa. And a little bit of a miscue. Australia is going to have another chance to hold here, but it looks like Japan is going to put on the same zone. We'll see what they do. Australia just needs to settle down a little bit, maybe take some of the edge off their throws uh, in this early morning game. Out to the middle. Back to the sideline. That's Tom Boyle. And an unfortunate turnover and a scuba into the end zone. And Japan opens up this game with a break, and they rush the field. Really excited here. That's a fantastic start for Team Japan. Uh, Australia just had a little bit of mix up there against that zone. Uh, they weren't crashing enough players in support. Uh, they really need to have those poppers coming in and supporting the handlers. Uh, you can see the high stall counts that Tom Boyle was having to handle there on the far sideline. Uh, and not a confident flick across that Japan could have had a chance there, but there is a little bit of height disadvantage there uh, up front as well uh, with the Japanese play, uh, shorter players playing in the cup and in the mids uh, and then saving their height for the deeps. Yeah, I agree. I think Australia, if, if they are going to take advantage of their height against this Japanese men's team, they're really going to have, they can use those uh, big throws, those high throws, but I think they need to take a little bit of an easier shot first. Take something maybe that's not a full field cross fl <laughs> fading flick. Uh, those are hard to catch and it gives a lot of chance for the defense to catch up uh, and then even set the zone again to slow them down further. So we see Australia's O-line out there again. We're going to collect Japan already set up in that junk zone. Australia moving things a little quicker. That's Ronald DeHagen with the disc in the middle. Out to the sideline. Matthew Hanna staying close to the sideline. Nice swing to the middle and they break through. Can they make it all the way? That's Oliver Lochnan. Back to O'Hagan. Really nice handler movement here. They're really dictating the field, working really hard. O'Hagan going to work back and forth all day. Australia doing a really good job here, not taking too many risky shots. We're on the sideline. O'Hagan with the disc. And he puts up that nice flick blade and Australia scores a bucket here. 
We are all knotted up at once in this exciting first match. That was great movement from Australia. They switched up their, their handlers there, going with uh, Lochna, O'Han, Han, O'Hagan, and Hannah. And you could see that line was much more confident moving against the zone. Uh, especially at the juniors level, you do have uh, a lot of mix and experience. So good call by the coaching staff there to anticipate another zone, go out with uh, a lineup that's perhaps more confident and used to actually moving it. And then Team Japan staying with the zone well past their own brick mark uh, and just keeping that pressure. And you could see how much movement they had to do outside of the end zone uh, before they took that little bit of blade, which the conditions are actually conducive to. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it was like night and day in between the two offensive lines there for Australia. The second offensive line, they were moving, they were throwing the disc back and forth using the full width of the field, uh, and instead of standing still and trying to impress us with their throws, they were using their legs. Uh, big props to Mr. O'Hagan out there, really working hard. And now we'll get our first look at Australia's D-line and Japan's offensive line and see what they can do here. Australia going down, looks a little bit junky. Japan with the disc on the sideline, that's number 77, Takase. Back to the middle. Australia shutting things down, but Japan gets one back off, out to the sideline. That's Kurihara, back to Shimizu. Looking deep, and he throws it. There's a big defender in the area, but he can't quite get there. Japan picks it up, throws one out to space, and maybe not the intended receiver, but that's number 23, Taku Kojima, scores a goal for Japan. That vertical stack has paid off the second time, and the first point on defense, that vert stack, once again, there was a deep cutter that... It was just a fantastic throw to. This time as well, mistimed a little bit, it seems, by Pat Graham. I believe that's number 31. And uh, that, that I think he's got to figure out how to recover from it. And the, the team, the coaching staff there is getting him back into the game right now. Uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough being beat by a much shorter <laughs> person on offense uh, or on defense. Um, but this is... This is early game. This is the time to actually kind of key things in, dial it in, and then come out even harder. Absolutely. And I, th I think uh, traditionally the Japanese teams, both men and women, have been known for their throwing skills. And in comparison to how many teams play, particularly the North American teams, but I think Australia falls into this sort of same category here. Their throws seem a little bit unconventional. That flick throw, even though it was on the open side, it faded in a way into the break side that made it a little bit more difficult for uh, Pat Graham to read it, uh, and that's how they were able to come up with that grab. A big pull from Japan, an unfortunate red zone turnover. Japan's going to pick up just about at the brick mark. That's number 55 with the disc, Nagakawa. And laying out, can't quite get there. Japan content to move it back and forth very quickly. But again, a little bit too much tension. And Australia's gonna get another chance to move it the full 70. Out to the sideline. Number 27, that's James Walker. Looking upfield, out to 23. Staying on the sideline, nice grab by Alan Kidd. Oh, and a run through catch block. A little bit of contact, but it looks like the players aren't gonna call anything there. That's a nice D by Wataru Morishita. And the Japanese D-line is gonna get another shot here. Calm things down, that's a really tight looking stack. Australia throwing their bodies around. Japan looking break side and out deep. Ryoma Shida really didn't have that much there. That stack was really, really tight. Uh, 
just waiting for a pick to happen, a little bit too clustered for anyone to really shake free from their defender. They are also playing just one handler, six in the stack there. there was, uh, you might be used to a more traditional setup where there's two handlers back, but they had put everyone upfield to try and generate something. Uh, it's, it's interesting to watch and see the style. Nice grab, looking upfield. We might have a huck coming out here. All the way and laying out, that's Josh Go. Did he ever go to the end zone? That's a nice grab, a throw from Matthew Hanna. And Australia back on the board here. That's a long hold for Australia. They're really gonna have to clean things up if they wanna um, make this game a little bit more efficient for themselves. Yeah, this is uh, a good matchup in Pool A. Australia is the seventh seed in the pool. Japan is the third seed in the pool. So Japan, the stronger uh, team in this matchup. And they have shown that so far. Um, Australia has to clean up, as you said, completely clean up their play. There's been th uh, throws that have been over under. Japan had a tight, uh, similar sort of setup when they were just outside of the end zone. They could have had another break right there. Uh, this is a place where the experience builds now for the rest of the tournament. It's the first game of the tournament. It's a good matchup. And I expect that things will actually heat up a little bit more over the next few points. Yeah, I think I think if Japan can, they're some of the... Th what they've done well so far is made Australia feel frantic. They've been putting on a lot of pressure, forcing Australia to throw things that might not be the best idea. But on, on a turn, Japan needs to then relax a little bit and not be so frantic themselves so that they can uh, score some goals of their own. So Australia with a big pull right into the end zone. Number 35 in the middle. That's Yamamoto. Oh, and laying out, but a nice grab. There's another throw to the break side, that flick to the break side, but looks like there's a travel call. So the throw is going to go back to where the huck occurred with uh, Nakagawa. Uh, it, oh, pardon me, that's um, Yamamoto. And that was a great throw. It's when the when the uh, the flick blades like that over to the break side, the defender really doesn't have much of a chance to get into that space. Back to the middle, Japan doing a good job using the full width of the field, moving back and forth, Australia trailing. And it's up. Just outside the end zone. And nice movement from Japan, tic-tac-toe all the way up the field. And it looks like we are, I believe, 3-2 for Japan. And that was beautiful movement by Yamamoto, number 35. Uh, all the handlers are watching upfield as the cutters are coming in and adjusting fantastically. They're not seeing themselves as the primary cutter into that upline space. They're watching to see what's going on upfield and then just powering through to make their own upfield cut. This Japanese vertical stack is very well timed and the throws coming off of it they're trusting throwing when the player is passing through the blind spot and the cutter upfield knows it's coming so a lot of chemistry on this team and they might be going with a uh, smaller set of plays but they practice them very well you can just see the level of skill from that offensive point yeah, I absolutely agree. You can definitely tell. It looks like the, the Japanese team has maybe practiced a little bit more together. They've gotten some more touches in because they, they can flow off of each other really, really well. It's not a reactive move. They, they already know that someone's there for them when they're throwing upfield. So Australia is going to collect this pull out to the middle. That's number 99, Harry O'Hagan. In the middle. Australia loving these blades. Oh, and a throw almost into the turf, but a nice collection. We are sticking close to the sideline. That's Aiden Smith with the disc. Out to Hannah. Back up field, nice grab. 
It's James Walker with the disc. Stall count's getting a little high, but he gets it to the middle. Ronald O'Hagan. And an unfortunate bounce off the hands of Aiden Smith, but still good movement from this Australian O-line. I think uh, I think having O'Hagan back there, he's a really mature handler and he's doing a lot of work. Oh, and a foot block right about the brick mark. That's a nice play uh, by by Aiden Smith to get back get back on O. He's going to look into the end zone and puts up a nice flick across the field out into space. That's Edmund Feng. And a call in the end zone. Looks like maybe a pick here. Matthew Hanna, lefty throw. He's moving, creating space. We're right outside the end zone. Australia puts up a hammer, and that's a nice grab. I believe that's Edmund Feng with the goal for Australia. It was looking really disciplined there until the last minute, Tushar, but uh, they still were able to pick that one up. It was. It's interesting uh, with Japan's defense here. They've been forcing backhand uh, the pretty much the entire game, as I can see so far. And this has caused Australia to change up things a little bit. Throws have been a little bit easier. But at the same time, with that backhand force on that point, I didn't see the same defensive pressure in previous points. Uh, the drop by Aiden Smith there was unforced. Uh, he got the foot block. Uh, and then after that, he was pretty much getting every other disc or every third disc. There was no defensive pressure on him. And they really need, Japan needs to find those players and put their better defenders on them. Um, that, this game is still very tight. It's 3-2, or is it 3-3 now? It's 3-3 now, and Japan needs to start pulling away now if their seed is where they are currently ranked. Uh, Australia very much in this game. Absolutely. I think we're going to be seeing a tight game all day. Uh, sorry, all game here. We've got a big pull from Australia. Unfortunately, looks like that's not going to stay in. Almost leaves the complex. <laughs> There's a very slight breeze here. Wind conditions not really playing a part in this game. Uh, when we started this morning, it was 15 Celsius. And by the end of the game, it'll be 21. So it is going to get a lot warmer. Players are going to need to start hydrating sooner. Coaching staff's going to need to manage that. And for anyone at home, that's sort of uh, low, low mid-70s, I believe. Okay, so Japan, they got quite the yardage advantage there because of that out pull. Looks like a foul on the thrower. Back to the middle, Japan content to move it back and forth if they don't see anything upfield. Australia putting on a zone of their own here. Junkie look, clogging up the lane with a switching mark. And a nice step around, but a holster, and we're moving, still moving back and forth. That's Yamamoto with the disc. Australia out to person defense now. Nice around shot from uh, Kurihara. Up. Oh. And there it is, a nice def defensive play from Australia right in the end zone. And now they're going to have to work it up the full field. Oh. And oh. A little bit of a miscue there and a lot of contact. I'm not sure if he's going to call a foul. One of the things we were talking about yesterday was the difference in, in contact rules in WIFDIF uh, versus 
USAU ultimate rules, but uh, looks like uh, Australia's not going to make a call here. He didn't really have a play on the disc after, after the bobble. So Japan is going to pick up. That's Kuta Yamamoto right outside the end zone, about five yards outside the end zone. Japan has that six-person stack moving across, really quick movement. That's Kurahara with the disc and a nice break shot right to the front cone. And that's another goal for Japan. I'd like to look at that a little bit of the transition. Uh, when Japan had that zone on them, they came back with four handlers, consistently four handlers. And then when they actually melted, the offense reacted almost immediately to go into their 2-5 stack. When they got close to that end zone, though, it got messy. It was not a clean stack. The handlers were clogging up right in the, in the front. Uh, they had really had to holster it on one of the resets, otherwise an Australian player would have had the D. Uh, and, and that break, uh, that just speaks to the quality of their ability to throw low, uh, low release, <laughs> essentially uh, break backhands. And that means that Australia is doing something right right now. They need to figure out what that is and go from there. Uh, Japan's huck as well, that was mistimed. It's been working, but I think they got overconfident on it. They had a shot about two seconds earlier that had two players wide open deep. Uh, they, they need to not get overconfident with that right now. Absolutely, and I, I'm sure Australia's coaches have been talking to them in between points, that D-line, making sure that their players know that they're staying tight, uh, especially when throws goes, go deep because they know they're going to fade a little bit over to the break side. So we have Australia back on O, and a big huck goes up. <laughs> and a nice grab. That's number 55, Lachlan Eichner, right outside the end zone. A quick dump back. Ah, and too bad. He can't hang on to that one. Huge throw. I believe that was from number six, Oliver Lochnan. Nice throw out into space. Uh, maybe hung a little bit longer than he wanted to. The Japanese player was able to get under it as well. Uh, but a, a nice grab and a foot block. I believe that's our second foot block of the game. Second one by Aiden Smith. Very impressive. Australia is going to pick up and an inside shot right away. That's a nice throw. Australia getting really fired up here, as they should be. This game is still tied up. We're fours each, uh, and <laughs> this is really getting exciting. That was a perfectly executed end zone play, and to set it up, not from a, a timeout or anything like that, um, shows a lot of discipline as well on the Australian side. So that was a flood stack uh, with the uh, last player coming in. So essentially they're isolating that player with all the defenders moving. The zone that Japan also ran, the deep, deep, was not as confident on the attack. They, they had position advantage, but then they gave it up. And they need to build on that confidence that they can, they can go and attack it. Uh, a lot of the times the taller players can't actually get as much vert. Uh, they can't actually jump as high off the ground. So it's a little bit deceptive as to what their reach might be. So if you get in front of them, you can many times make a good play as a slightly shorter player. And there was not that much of a height difference there. It was very doable to get the D there for Team Japan. And uh, they need to do that next time. Japan out to the sideline, looking deep. They've got two players going deep. And back under. On the sideline, that's Kurahara. Might see one of his nice break throws here. There it is. Great throw, losing some yards, but out to plenty of space. 21, that's Kobayasha. Throws it deep. Number 77. Unfortunately, this time, Pat Graham, he's not going to make that mistake again, shuts it down. Australian O. That's Prendergast with the disc. Oh, and a layout D attempt. 
and a big huck out to Pat Graham again, and he gets it. That is bookends for Pat Graham. He has turned it on, and he is out to play. Pat Graham is back in this game. After that first miscue, he's really dialed it in. That was a great defensive effort, not to put anything past Japan, but they had a great shot there as well. If they'd taken it maybe half a second earlier, that deep put would have worked. Japan's looking a little bit uncertain right now on some plays. Uh, on the vert stack that they had, they were running initially, there was a miscue in the middle where a cutter went deep and realized that there was already someone deep. So they, they had a little bit of a, as a miscue at that point as well. And they just need to dial it in. There was apologies immediately on field. They have called off and holstered it a few times. Uh, so Kurihara there did not send it deep a couple times when he had the option. And uh, this shows that uh, they're really respecting the deep shot and the, uh, sorry, the deep defenders on Team Australia. This is going to get exciting right now <laughs> because Australia has a chance to break. Australia with the big pull, getting lots of height. Japan catching it in the middle. And great hustle by Australia. They're down there already putting on their zone. It's that junky look, number 61 on the mark. That's Alan Kidd out to space. Japan doing a good job of staying calm here. 35, Yamamoto shot to the middle. Nice break throw again. Looks like Australia is going to go to person defense now. They're hollering on the sideline. And a nice layout grab. That's N Naka Haka Hakama. Japan moving quickly here back and forth. Australia having a hard time catching up. And the inside fake with a high release flick. All the way across, that's Kobayasha in the middle, and another nice break throw. That's out to Taka Kojima, and Japan really showing their stripes here as its throwers, I think. At that point, Savior was Nakakamada. I apologize if I said that. But that layout on that far side to maintain it on essentially the, the line uh, was what broke Australia there. Once they got to that point, everyone could flood forward. They could get into their end zone play and really start to take advantage of a different sort of movement rather than the upfield movement that they've been wanting to have. It's a much more dangerous place for uh, the defending team because now you have to defend both sides, the, the, both sides of the field equally because any throw to that point will essentially end the point. Right? So that save there in the position change this point completely if it had just been a run on there wouldn't have been as much of a, a pause to see if they dropped it um, and I I think this is a, a really strong handling line that Japan needs to be putting out there again and again it's now tied at fives with I think Australia's upper break correct I wish I could tell you I was <laughs> keeping track of who's broken who, but they've been going back and forth so many times now. But here we'll see another sh another chance at this, uh, the original Australian O-line. This is the O-line. They really like their, their flick breaks. They really like their around um, blading flicks as well. So we'll see what we see from them. They're moving really quickly here. This is a lot more movement than we saw before. And a huck goes up. It's way up in the air. There's three Japanese players in the area, but number 15, that's Nicholas Hodson, comes out with it. What do you think about that throw? If you've got two defend, uh, offenders, <laughs> offenders. <laughs> if you've got two players, receivers that tall going deep with essentially very few Japanese players, you do have to put it out there. Um, they were wide open in the end zone. 
I would have liked to see something a bit bladier, though. <laughs> and I think that's been the more common style is to try and get it there more quickly, take it higher, uh, not allow the defense to get as much of a time to read it. Um, so I think that's, that's the big difference there. You don't want hospital passes as much as possible. After that play, all the players picked themselves up, high-fived each other, and we've seen great spirit. Uh, when Pat Graham scored that point in the end zone, following that, the Japanese coaches high-fived him on the sideline Nice. Uh, as, as we were halfway through the previous point. And so we're seeing a lot of spirit out here. Where both teams are recognizing great plays and the mutual respect of the game uh, for everyone making the journey out here and then still playing hard but ensuring that everyone's still going to be as safe as possible. And we're seeing that in front of us right now as well as the players are high-fiving each other. Both teams are initiating it. All right. Australia chasing down that pull. We see Aiden Smith out there wondering if he's going to get a foot block hat trick for this game. He's on the mark on the far sideline. Japan moving it back and forth. We're in the middle. And Australia doing a quicker transition defense than we've seen in the past. They're out to person already. But Japan is really taking advantage of it. That's a big huck. That's a, lo a lot of speed separation. And just, just out of the fingertip reach there. That was a great throw, a great second effort. I believe by... Uh, so it was a number 21 Kobayashi mm. with a beautiful, beautiful throw. Uh, I wish I was out there running so I could I could get <laughs> someone throwing to me like that. So Australia is going to pick up. We've got one player really deep. Everyone else clustering pretty close to the disc. Japan looking like they're playing person defense with a couple of poaches out in the middle here and there. But that's O'Hagan out there ready to do some work for this Australian D-line. Nice grab. That's number 27, James Walker. Stuck on the sideline, looking to the break side. And it's tight. Is he going to run it down? Nice. Taking his time. Back to Lochnan. Hagen running out of options but able to find Lachnan. We're really hugging the sideline here. Australia should probably use one of their break throws to create a little bit of space. <laughs> there it is. Perfect shot. That's Josh Go. O'Hagan again. Lachnan surveying the field. Not a lot of options. And a perfect shot out to the back cone. That's Josh Go, his second goal of the game. We saw him earlier with that flying layout. Great grab. That was a long point, and Australia had to grind it up. So big props to Japan there for making sure that was a long point. The way they did it is that they took unders early on, but then they left, uh, they took the deeps as well. So there were no deep options for Team Australia there. Uh, a lot of that switching you saw earlier in the point also contributed to that. They had, Australia had resets. It was not difficult for them to reset it. Yes, they were on the sideline a few times, but even when you looked at that, you could see that the players coming back, like Josh Go, he's listed as a receiver, but he's seeing the opportunity. He's coming back. And that's a confidence-building moment for Team Australia. You don't only have to have uh, handlers coming back. Uh, Team Japan has called a timeout here as well. They do need to adjust. They are down 7-5 right now. So Australia up with a couple of breaks at this point. Um, we can also see on that point Nick Everendiadis, if I can say <laughs> that correctly. I'm sure they'll correct me during halftime, but uh, He's listed as a utility player, and he was everywhere. Uh, he's also got a lot of power. You could see him chase down that deep, deep dump at that same point. 
Uh, so a lot of depth on this on this Australian team that is now starting to pull away. And dare we say, it's potentially an upset in Pool A at this point. <sighs> I don't know about that, Tushar. It's it's still, we're at 7-5. We still have another, at least one more point into half. And I think this Japanese team, we've seen such great discipline from them and they're working so hard out there. I really, I can see them coming back. Um, I think that something that they could do is take a little different defensive look on Australia. They've, they've put out that zone a few times and I think Australia has figured out how to use their movement, how to use their legs to break it. Uh, it is it is really tough for the for the D line to go out there and to create those long points, uh, but to not convert to a break. Sometimes it doesn't feel like you're doing that much, but really, a D line's job is to go out there and make the o the opposite O line's job as hard as it can be and tire them out for later on in the game. So I think this is kind of. This could be where the wind changes. We don't really know what we're going to see. I, I think I think the game is going to stay relatively close. I think uh, both teams are similar, similar in skill level, but very different in style. So we'll see what they can do. Japan on offense here after that timeout. They've got a player striking deep. And an unfortunate miscue, that inside flick not exactly what they wanted. So Australia is gonna pick up. They're just outside the brick and there goes one of those flicks to number 31 and Deed a little bit out of bounds. Not enough angle on that one. So now we see Japan's that, that tight stack. Oh, and a huge layout D. That's number 13, Blake Nichols. Unreal, safe play, but a great, great layout D. And he's going to take the initiating cut spot in the end zone. And Australia is going to put it back out to the middle. They're just right on the doorstep looking for a little bit of patience and a nice grab. That's number 32, Tom Boyle in the end zone from number 10. Angus Wicks. Holy moly, that layout D was incredible. I really hope someone got a photo of that because I want to post that on our social media. <laughs> that was that was impressive offense, uh, good defense. Uh, Japan, though, did not get set up right from the get-go. There was a little bit of hesitation, a little bit of crossover. Adjustments that can be made now at this point in, uh, in, because we're just starting out halftime as well. Australia, that first point, uh, that first throw to Pat, should have been a point. Um, as you said, a little bit more angle. Uh, we have to remember though that, you know, they're not as experienced as you. That, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and this is the first game in a long tournament. It is Sunday, both of these teams are probably going to be playing right through to the last day as well. Uh, as I said earlier, is, is there an upset possible? It Really, these two teams are such high quality. We are expecting to see them right through into that last day. 8-5 um, going into half. Any thoughts on the first half? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really impressed by, by Australia. I think at the start there, things were looking a little hairy, um, especially in the first point. We saw a lot of stagnation from their handlers, uh, and I think they did a really good job of pulling up their shorts and, and deciding that they were going to work a little bit harder. I think that that was really it. At the start, it seemed like they were content. They're great throwers, uh, and they have a lot of tall receivers and a lot of, um, as they describe themselves, utility players, players that can play both uh, behind the disc or, or in the backfield. So I think that decision, the mental switch that they were going to work hard in that game, in this game, really changed things. On the flip side, I think Japan's done a great job on defense, forcing a lot of pressure turnovers. Uh, I think Australia wasn't expecting that zone, the three-person cup up in front, uh, and and the poaches really surprised them. So I think, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting second half. It'll be interesting to see what Japan does to adjust a little bit here, uh, to, to see what they can do to slow things down. 
Um, but we're going to take a quick break. Um, we just want to do a quick shout out to some of our sponsors here, Cut Camps. This is the Cut Camps uh, field, showcase field, field number one. So a big thanks to them. Also, VC Ultimate, Greatest Bags, and Discraft. Thank you for everything that you do for Ultimate. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes here. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us on the stream. This is the World Junior Ultimate Championships here in Waterloo. We are on the showcase field at Rim Park, brought to you by Cut Camps. Uh, if you're just joining us right now, we have Australia facing off against Japan. Australia just took half, eight to five. It's been an exciting game. It's been a spirited game. We just want to take a quick, uh, quick moment to shout out our game advisors who haven't been involved at all. Uh, but we have Alex Tacconi from Guelph, so he's a local fella. And then also Steve Baker coming to us from Perth, from Australia. He was there at the U24 Championships in Australia and Japan or in, uh, in January. So thank you for coming all the way to, to Waterloo. Um, we're just about to put up our first poll, Australia here on defense uh, and Japan to receive. The big lefty poll. Japan's going to collect. That's Kurihara, one of the central handlers here on the J Japanese squad. Australia putting out that zone again, a little bit junky, sort of a loose three-person cup. Japan doing a great job all game of working it across the field. Australia to trap on the sideline. Back to the middle. And almost a defensive bid by James Walker there, but he, he reels it in.
Japan. Nice shot out to the break side, doing a good job. And a look downfield, unfortunately, a little bit too blady. I think, I think the thrower there, number 35, that's Kuta Yamamoto, maybe tensed up a little bit before that throw. He saw that it was open and he had a small window and tried to get it off. Uh, and unfortunately came out a little bit too quick for his receiver. And Kobayashi as a receiver really has to turn and go. He can't back up on that. Mm -hmm. Australia in the center of the field. That's number 23, Evraniadis. Back to the middle. And a nice D attempt. Looking at the end zone, he was thinking about his hammer, but checks himself, dumps it back to Aiden, Aiden Smith, our foot block extraordinaire. Australia, really deep stack here. They're kind of shutting off any options that they might have downfield. And sort of a Hail Mary break throw. Number 27, that's James Walker, makes an attempt to lay out, but that would have been a really tough grab. It's really hard to lay out when the disc is coming right at you. It's a lot easier when it's fading away and you have time to sort of set up your, set up your bid. So Japan is going to go back into the six-person stack, one handler back. And it's a little bit busy, but that's Naka Hakamada on the sideline. And looking deep, oh, and intercepted. Aiden Smith just racking up the defensive plays in this game. That's a nice, nice heads up D. If you're watching from home, the matchup to, to look for is Nick Evernadias. Nice. That was some great pressure defense from Japan there. That was number 27. James Walker really didn't have any options upfield. Uh, his players were totally covered, and he just ran out of stall counts, looks like. Oh, and another D. That's Matthew Hanna gets it back, and uh, Australia is going to be back on O here. That's such a tough spot right along the line. There's not much space to catch it. The throw has to be quality, and the handler just has to run right through it. Like, the receiver's just got to run hard. And they slowed up a little bit. Uh, Japan is throwing well. They just need to push a little bit harder on those cuts. I totally agree. And I, I think Japan has been doing really well with their pinpoint throws. Uh, and they have been hugging the sideline, but that one was just a little bit too tight. And the defender was just a little bit too close. Runs it down, nice patience. It's number 99, Harry O'Hagan, holding for a long time, but a nice collection. I believe that's Matthew Hanna. And that attempt at a layout D just opens up the field. Evernatus, no defense for a few passes there, able to go back and forth. Aiden Smith with the disc now, very close mark. A little bit too close, not a lot of disc space there. Oh my goodness. Australia getting a little too fancy. They need to calm down here. Look towards the end zone. And there's that flick blade out into space, right on the back line. I believe that throw came out from Matthew Hanna, number nine, the lefty, able to put that flick right out into space, right out to the back line at the back cone, space for days. I think the receiver there was number 27, James Walker, uh, well run on to, well positioned throw. Uh, the matchup that I was speaking about earlier is Australia's number 23, uh, Nick Evernard, yes. I pronounced it four different ways now. I think you <laughs> pronounced it a different way as well. We'll eventually get it. Uh, but the matchup that was there in the middle of the point was with number 49, Futa Tanaka. 
and Tanaka was doing a fantastic defensive job. That was an excellent matchup. And then it changed halfway through the point. And that change there, I don't agree with how that matchup changed because Nick was then getting open. He was making plays. He was creating space for others. And you need the player like Tanaka there to shut that down. Uh, they tried with Kobayashi to, to do that, uh, but there was a little bit of an over, overbid. We, I think we need to get more of number 49 Tanaka on there matching up against those higher impact utility players, especially when Australia is not really sticking to their roles. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's really hard. A defensive line will put out maybe two or three handler covers and then three or four or five um, receiver receiver covers uh, and sometimes when you're dealing with utility players and if you're a specialized defender it becomes really difficult um, to have to switch back and forth when when you're the player that you're trying to cover is is running the full field here we have Japan right around midfield here doing a good job moving it back and forth we see a few different different handlers out there it's different than our other O-line, an unfortunate, a nice bid from number eight, that's Yoshinaga, but unfortunately just bounces right out of his hands. And Australia is gonna get a chance here. Losing some yards, gaining some yards. That's number one, Seth Lovell. Unfortunate. Looks like number 15 there, Nicholas Hodson, just changed what he was going to do mid-throw, saw that there was another open player and, and rushed his throw a little bit, unfortunately, straight into the turf. Japan back on offense. Stall count getting high. Matsuda gets a, does a good job of, of getting it back to the middle of the field. Back to Matsuda. Looking upfield, nice throw. And a quick hammer. That's a great throw, but it looks like there's some sort of call here. Australia would be good to use the whiff diff hand signal so us in the booth could relay what the call is, but I would assume it's probably a pick. So it's gonna go back to number 10. That's Datsuke Saikawa. We'll see if he puts out another hammer there. His, uh, he has a, a big, big open space on the break side. And a nice throw, outside in throw, right around the defender. That's a tough throw, but a great read and a great put out into space by Japan. That was great movement to create that space as well. Uh, this was a long point for Japan as well. There were, there were gas. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, and for them to get the point, have to send it back because of a call, which is fair, and then to create the space rather than just try and power through in the corner, um, allowing the handler to cut up field and get that easy point at that point because they could really run onto it. In that case, Matsuda had so much space to run onto, he checked whether he needed to go early. No, nope, I'm going to go safe. And that hammer that came before as well, there was good communication from um, players on the field to show, yes, I'm open, I see the space. And they're really trusting each other. That's great chemistry to see from a team as well. That game is now at 9-6. And we are seeing throwaways from both teams. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily the same level of uh, you know forced defensive uh, kind of errors, I guess, but there's more throwaways from miscues on offense. And uh, that needs to resolve itself fairly quickly, and whichever team does that will be able to, to take this win at this point, despite the score. And like we said earlier, Australia, seven seed, Japan, three seed, if they're going to want to go far in this tournament, they can't be making throwing errors like that because other teams, particularly Team Canada, Team USA, who are at the top of this tournament, they're, uh, they're going to absolutely punish turnovers like that. And from a weather perspective, being as someone from Waterloo, you as well, this is the best it's going to get. <laughs> yes. 
I, uh, I was here in, in 2014, the Canadian National Championships were held here around the same time, August. I think it was about the same weekend too in 2014 and it was maybe the most miserable I've ever been. <laughs> it was raining, it was hailing, it was windy and it was cold. Oh, Australia just outside the end zone. A nice bid by number 11, Udai Kato. Scoop cut. Scoop cut gets cut by number 23. That's Matsudo. Nice D. Good to see him back out there. That's a great defensive play. Uh, and a, a maybe not as much effort as we should have seen from Australia. That should have been faked off. Looked for the around. And a huge hammer out into space. That's a nice throw. And another big throw. I think that's going to be out of the reach, unfortunately. Good help defense from number 55 on Australia. That's... Uh, Lachnan Eichner peeling off of his player to help help with that defense. Yeah, Yoshioka was looking for Kato on that one and uh, just needed to maybe flatten it a little bit, but probably not the best target uh, for when the disc is going over someone's head uh, as well. You can see Nick now cutting in the midfield. And Japan has that zone back out there looking to trap Australia on the sideline, but Australia's got that handler line with a lot of movement and running out to space, nice legs from 61. That's Alan Kidd moving quickly. Unfortunately, that throw is just gonna fade out of bounds. Like we said, there's not a ton of wind here, but, but when we pan back to the other side of the field, you'll see the flags are starting to move a little bit more. Uh, from, on, from your screen at home going left to right, that's the, the way that the wind is going. So this is the downwind side of the field. And if you're putting a throw, especially a flick with, a, with an inside out uh, angle there, it's gonna be really easy for that throw to go out of bounds. Japan puts up a huck of their own. Number 84, Yoshioka, all on his own. And number 12, Izuhara, dunks on two Australia players for the goal here. So now we are at, I believe, 9-7. Uh, Australia still up, but Japan climbing back in. Another good break, and that set play was fantastic. We shouldn't put it past Australia, though. They were knocking on the door. Uh, once again, it's an offensive error, unforced, and as we spoke about just a few minutes ago, that's what needs to be cleaned up. Uh, I've seen from Australia as well uh, in the previous few points is they've really tightened up the distance on, on uh, defense. So they're playing much tighter D, and Japan is not having the same easy resets it did earlier. Uh, and that tighter defensive effort is something that Japan needs to adjust to right now. That set play they essentially ran there was a dump huck and then an air bounce, which <laughs> was close. It, mm -hmm. it, that was very close. Uh, and if the receiver in the end zone had just pulled up for even the tiniest of moments, uh, Australia would have had a good bid on that. So we're now getting to those points where we start to see late game stage, how do teams tighten up? And this is the part of the game where the the mental strength becomes so important when it's tight. You can see there, pull bouncing around. Australia looking a little frantic already. And there it is, a huck to the end zone. Number 15, Nicholas Hodson, outrun by two Japanese players. That was a Hail Mary throw uh, out from 32. That's Tom Boyle, he really didn't have any options there. No, and you can see it on the faces as well. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I, I apologize to the, <laughs> the folks at home. Um, you could see it on the players as well. As Australia came in to pick it up, there was that bobble, and mm -hmm. the cut started a moment early, and that set the tone. You really have to focus on picking up the disc, and only that. Yeah, I think, I think pole collection is, is one of the parts of the game Oh, and an unfortunate turnover by Japan. Australia is gonna get another chance here, right on the doorstep. 32, Tom Boyle is gonna pick up, and a nice high-release backhand out onto the break side to Blake Nichols. And that's really lucky for Australia, I think. 
extremely lucky. Heartbreaking for Japan there. Mm -hmm. They did a fantastic job with their defense on that point. Their D-line had the chance. Matsudo, unfortunately, slipped up a little bit. But they're joking about it a little bit as well right now on the <laughs> field. Uh, that's important. That is important as a team not to berate, but to support. We saw that early with Pat. And he came back with a couple points, the bookends as well. Uh, we're going to see that now with Team Japan. Uh, and this is an important moment because, yes, that was a gift. But the momentum is there, mm -hmm. right? Australia got lucky there with the drop. There wasn't the defensive pressure. But it goes back to that offense, those offensive errors we're seeing. Absolutely. What we were, what I was starting to stay, say earlier was um, the pull collection is so important to set up the rest of the play. Uh, it dictates the rest of the point, essentially. If you can if you can catch a pull, first of all, that's the most beneficial and set up a centering pass right away. But we could see when, when Australia was picking up there, they let the pull drop to the ground. And as he was picking up, he was looking up field instead of just focusing on picking up the disc. And that gave Japan a chance to set up all of the cutters were, were covered by them, the handlers were covered by them, and that made it so much more difficult, and that's what forced the turnover. And here we have Japan back on O. We see that classic D line out there, or sorry, O line out there. The usual suspects. Australia back out with that zone. 57, Kurahara out to 13, that's Kojima. Moving back and forth, using the break side. Oh, and a layout D attempt from number 20, Edmund Fang. A little bit too much contact there, I think. I think he should, he should uh, take a think about that later and, and think about whether that was a good idea or not, whether it was worth it. Uh, but we're, we're okay, we're back, we're continuing on offense. Japan really, really using the field. Being really patient, taking their time. Finding an open player in the end zone. That's number 49, Futa Tanaka. Great use of the space. Japan really using lots of cuts to shake their defenders uh, and, and throw to the open player. The unsung hero on that point has got to be and I apologize, I didn't get the number, but the player who stood outside and looked off five cutters. <laughs> I think that was Takase, number 77. And, and that, is, that is maturity, to just not force it in, to take your time, to swing it back to the middle, and then get that wide open, easy throw, rather than seeing those five cutters in space and they're all in the end zone, um, not doing something like throwing a scuba over the top mm -hmm. or, or things like that. That is the sort of leadership that will help develop the program further at home, will help develop the national teams further as well. We have a timeout now. Is that from Team Australia? I didn't see who, who called it there. I think, I think it would be reasonable to, to uh, guess that it was Australia maybe looking to slow down a little bit of Japan's momentum here. Uh, Japan within one now, Australia at nine, Japan at eight, coming out of that deficit at half, I believe it was eight five for, for Australia. So um, Japan really collecting themselves. They're bringing that mental side of the game. They're pushing through uh, and really doing a great job here. Tushar, what do you think the difference has been for Japan in the second half? I've, I would say that Japan has been playing almost essentially the same way. I think Australia has been messing up more. This isn't um, Japan necessarily amping it up to another degree. They've been very steady throughout the whole game. Um, but Australia has been uh, giving it away a, a little bit more. Uh, they're still up 10-8 right now. But the body language has also changed. And so you can see that with Japan. They've been very consistent uh, from what I've been seeing. Uh, but Australia's body language has changed. You can see that on the sideline. You can see that on the field. Japan, still amped up, still focused the same way. Uh, and that, I think, is a big difference. 
is that Australia has actually stepped back a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had the throwaways, you've had the miscommunications, which they didn't have in the first half. Um, and Japan has, in the last few points, also put a little bit more pressure on defense. We've seen that turnover, but we've also seen their turnover right outside the end zone, mm -hmm. right back. Uh, that has been very similar to the first half. Australia to pick up the pull right on the cone. That's a tough spot, but they get it off. Low throw, but still collected. That's number four, Prendergast. Great eyes on that. Back to the middle. Australia still looking a little complacent here. I'd like to see them run with their legs a little more, fake with a little bit more conviction. This is not confident handling. But there goes that throw, and a nice read by number 25, Aiden Barron, and a throw into the end zone. Australia. I, I'm not... That should have been a D. Personally, I feel like there could be more pressure on it. That was not a confident throw. We didn't see confident handling back there. Australia still needs to dial that in. Their body language for Australia also from the handlers right now as we're watching them. It's not confident to the where they were at the beginning of the game or even when they started going up a little bit. That was an uncertain point. Mm -hmm. And you can sense that as well. Uh, so... 11-8 right now, but still anyone's game. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think, I think Australia, I'm actually, I'm really enjoying watching Australia play. I think they've got such a diverse range of players, different playing styles within their own team, but relatively cohesive as, as, uh, as a playing style. I think that they're going to start doing really well as the day moves on, as the week moves on, and they get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, and I think they have a chance to go far in the bracket. I, the one thing that I have to say, though, is throws like that, that huge looping OI flick, that's not a championship-level throw. And it's, it's just going to be a matter of them maybe spending some more time on the pitch, throwing with each other, and thinking about what the correct throw is. Because if Japan were in that case, I know that they would take a look at that throw and dump it and then maybe try again next time. Yeah, there's nothing like a tournament to help you progress as a team. <laughs> Japan back in their own end zone. Moving back and forth. Australia out with this junky three-person cup. Japan content to throw things three to five yards, keeping it close. And you'll see this. They'll just happily swing it until the zone melts away. Absolutely. The discipline from this Japanese handler core is so impressive. Japan, quick shot through the middle, but shut down by Ronald O'Hagan, the central handler on this Australian squad. Incredible heads-up defense, and Australia... Unfortunate, but that's a turnover from Matthew Hanna. That lefty throw tried to get that flick off out to the back corner, but unfortunately rifled it a little bit too hard. So Japan is going to get another chance here. Australia setting the zone again. Japan moving back and forth. And when you have those high percentage swings, which Japan does have, you stick with it until the zone essentially quits. Mm -hmm. You tire it out because then you're going to create so much space for yourself. And they've done that previously. That throw that tried to go through previous uh, through the middle earlier in this point, that was the one time they've tried to put it through, and it didn't work. Japan breaks it, and again... So they've got to just keep swinging it until <laughs> they... <laughs> the full 70. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Australia is going to get another shot here. They're picking up in the middle. That's number six, 
Oliver Lochnan was really looking downfield for a long time. Aiden Smith's going to take the shot instead. Two Japanese players in the end zone, and that's a nice D. That is a great defensive effort, and that was number... I believe number 35, Yamamoto, comes in, peels off his player to help with that floating disc. It really did sit for a long time, and number 13, Kojima, also in the area. It's, it's tough as an offensive player, uh, regardless of whether you have the best positioning or not. I think sometimes when you can hear the footsteps of two other defenders coming in to get you, it's kind of tough to focus, but uh, a nice defensive play. And that was coming in close to the line as well. Like you're, there's a whole bunch of conditions there. You're going downwind and you, the end zone ends coming up. You've got two defenders. Um, and Japan putting on that defensive effort. That's what we needed earlier. There's mm -hmm. been two, three points where they would have gotten the D had they just pushed a little bit more. Japan through the middle. Australia really living and dying by this zone here. They're, Japan's really testing the zone now. Previously, they've been content to swing it. Uh, they have been looking now in this point for more options through the middle to try and make that cup a little bit looser. Uh, the problem is, is you've got really good mids on this, on this zone from Australia. Australia really hitting the deck here, throwing their bodies around, trying to make Japan a little bit nervous. You can see, we can see here in the booth, the, the Japanese handlers in the backfield there, they're just smiling, looking at these Australian bodies that are flying. Australia what? transitions to person defense. At the uh, Australians that were in the cup, the three players, are a little bit gassed now. And that's what you want when you're handling against that cup is just to move it because now you're gonna have a mismatch. Your upline cuts are gonna be so much easier as handlers. Japan right on the sideline, 15 yards outside the end zone. Kurahara. Out back to the sideline, strikes up line, looking to the middle. It's 20 with the disc, Shimizu with a hammer. And unfortunately, just off the hands of Kurahara, who, who ran the full width of the field there for that hammer pass. But it was a little bit low, uh, and he had to try and, try and track it while he was moving and, and uh, coming around the bend there, unfortunately, straight off his hands. It's a messy end zone. And a huge throw, number 55 in the area, but another fantastic D from Japan. Trailing edge, that's Shimizu. Number 55 on, on uh, Australia there, Lachlan, Lachlan Eichner. It was a good, good cut, I think a good throw, a good decision, I think, but I think a fantastic play that by was the Japanese player. Great defense there and earlier I didn't say that whether Japan had improved or not but we've seen in the last three four points Japan has shifted and increased the defensive intensity they've especially on those long throws mm -hmm. maybe they've been playing the long game in uh, in not having early defensive pressure lulling Team Australia into a sense of uh, complacency but I don't think that's the case I think they just amped it up and Team Japan now has called a timeout. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what both teams do here. I imagine that Aust this is going to give Australia a chance to set up that zone, um, put some pressure on the handlers, have someone deep. I think uh, Japan, I've noticed their offensive setup against that zone, they've had two people deep and then only one person in the middle with a th um, with the four handlers back. And so maybe making a transition to overload the middle player 
uh, so that they can, um, sorry, the middle defender, have two players in the middle and one player deep that might open up a few more options because they're trying to break the cup a little bit more that might give them a ch chance to do that better uh, than having two people deep because the two deeps really aren't working that much. They're not trading in back and forth. They're not challenging the defender and making them uh, feel uncomfortable. And they haven't taken a shot to those deeps either. And so if they get it to the mids, which they haven't so far, uh, that one mid, uh, they may be able to take advantage of it at that time, but they haven't to date. Uh, it looks like they are setting up in a zone right now once again. Uh, they, this is an opportunity as well to swap out the players in the cup, not from off the field, but with other players on the field. Uh, they're going once again. With, no, they've put the two <laughs> deep once again. And what this also does is that it creates more of a person-to-person -person matchup up front. It's content to just be swinging it and keeping it moving. And Australia has done well. They are playing to more tightly on that fourth swing that comes around. Japan on the far sideline from us, just outside their end zone, swinging back and forth, full width of the field. I think maybe we're starting to see a little bit of fatigue from Japan here. They're not running as much they're not crashing this zone as much as they could be to try and gain more yards or at least reset the stall count and they've now done the switch that's the breakout that they wanted japan just outside the end zone we've got number 25 with the disc looking up field reset to 57 there's a pick called on the field. It, w it did affect that cut and should, this should go back. So Shimizu is going to go back to his defender. I believe that might be Aiden Smith. This is important here because that's the reset cutter and it's a slightly higher stall count. Kurahara, that's a nice break throw. We've been seeing those all day from him. Back to the middle, Shimizu. Out to Takahashi. Japan used, doing a great job of using all seven players on the field here. And a throw just outside of the reach of the defender. Number 13, Taku Kojima comes down with that right along the sideline. It's tight. <laughs> it is a tight. That look, <laughs> anytime a throw is going on over there, we're considering whether it's going to be in bounds or out of bounds. Players so far have been keeping it in bounds um, when it's tight. We've seen a few cases where when it's been OB, it's been out of bounds for by quite a bit. So mm -hmm. no one's really had to call in anyone to, uh, to say, okay, you know, give me some advice on whether that was in or out. No looking at the sidelines. So They've been keeping it along those lines. Thank goodness for line fields uh, from that perspective. What I have seen a little bit more of, especially on that cutting sequence there, um, is that the Australian defenders might have been drawing contact or intentionally putting up arms to try and block space out or push into players. It's a, it's a different style from what Team Japan is playing, mm -hmm. but it seems to be, in some cases, favoring um, blocking off space uh, by pushing on a player rather than actually um, trying to get to that space first. So that's a little bit of a, a change there. It has stopped Japan a few times. Uh, we'll see if they continue it or not as well. And that'll be because Ultimate is self-governed, especially under WIFDIF rules with our game advisors here. If Japan feels like that contact is too much, then they have every right to call in an advisor or they can, they can call a foul, call a contact, uh, and the game will move on accordingly. So, so now we have Australia out on O. Nice grab. That's 32. Tom Boyle on the sideline. Nice inside backhand shot. 
And a round flick. Australia doing a good job out into space. That's Aiden Barron with the break and then up the line. Nice throw there from both both um, both Australian players uh, and really using a more creative side of the space than we've seen them in the past. That's that's confident handling with that backhand force. There was no real pressure there. Yeah. Um, and when you've got some really tall players like Tom Boyle there as, as now handling in that spot, it's easier for them to reset, to work around the any sort of player. I find that when I have a backhand force put on me, it's just that much easier <laughs> as well, being taller and lankier, to get break throws on, to get little centering passes, um, to get them out quickly as well. Uh, the release point is so much different from your flick uh, as well. Uh, earlier you were speaking about they could call in a game advisor on contact and things like that. And most of the time I find a quick discussion on field can help. But one of the big reasons why there are game advisors is many times while we are speaking in English, we have such a representation of countries from around the world. We do need to have people who can either relay or sometimes explain things. Um, that typically is done by members of the teams themselves. And so when possible, that's what we try and encourage is for the players to resolve it amongst themselves or their team to resolve it amongst themselves. Game advisors are there simply for clarification of rules um, in many aspects uh, or to provide an opinion. Uh, they're not like observers in that sense that they can't make actual rulings and nothing they say is binding. Correct me if I'm wrong on that Nope, one. that's absolutely correct. So we have Japan here, able to move it pretty far up the field with not a lot of passes. Australia seems to be struggling to catch up here. We are right on the doorstep. And have the wind the is just the picked up. Yeah, the wind is picking up. We can see, if you can see the flags in the back of the shot, they're starting to move. A bit of a crosswind uh, fading out towards the far side of the field. So it's going to make it that much more difficult for Japan to score here because they are going sort of upwind-ish. But someone shakes free. That looks like number 13, Taka Kojima, does a great job. One of the key receivers on this Japanese squad. And it really didn't look like there was much defense at all on that point from Australia. No, and it can be very difficult when you're playing against short passes. When you have short, quick passes, there's no way to get momentum. And as taller players, you can't get pushing. Or even as a shorter player, by the time the receiver has moved, you're already one or two steps behind, and that's all it takes in that quick receiving game, the short passes that are slower. They're not fast passes. They're just coming out more quickly. And by doing that, defense is always going to be on their back foot, and Team Japan plays that game very well. Uh, we see that in many Japanese teams, they play that shorter, quick passing game. In many East Asian teams as well, we, we tend to see that given the influence of Japanese ultimate uh, throughout East Asia. Uh, we will get an opportunity to see different styles from East Asian uh, countries as well throughout this tournament. I believe China is playing later today on this field as well. But that was very tough to defend against for uh, Team Australia. We now have a game of 12-10 um, and a very strong Australian lineup for offense. This is the more confident, I would say, against a zone handling line. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. So Australia going to pick up. That's Hagen. We've seen a few great plays from him today, working really hard, got that layout D in the zone when they were on, on defense. That's Oliver Lochnan out to the middle. Nice, nice floaty throw. And a layout bid by Japan S opens up a lot of the field. Aiden Smith back to O'Hagan. Out to Lochnan. Australia really looking casual here, not too worried at all about the Japanese defense. Aiden Smith puts one out into space. 
but it's just a little bit too far. That's a pretty tough angle to lay out onto. That's one problem about these these blade throws that Australia is putting out. There's really only one point of contact when the when the disc is coming down for you to catch it. it the, the margin of error is so much smaller than a flat throw, uh, and it makes it really tough, especially uh, maybe when you're not expecting it to be able to situate yourself to set up a bid. So now we have Japan back on offense. Nice play. That's Matsuda with the huck out into space, but just a little bit too far uh, for Izuhara. And correct me, uh, it was Yoshinaga actually with that throw. A great throw, just what we were talking about, starting out on the open side, but fading over to the break side, just out of reach of, of the defender. The defender never had any sort of play on that. It was just a little bit too quick. We were talking about how that's now the downwind side of the field. The disc is going to be traveling a little faster, a little lower. It's not going to be hanging for as long. And so both teams are going to have to adjust in that, in that sense. Now Australia is going to be going upwind or uh, uphill, as sometimes we like to call it. They're going to have to work a little bit harder here. Oh, and a layout attempt in the end zone. But Australia able to con convert. Japan's really tight right now, putting on a lot of pressure. This is impressive. Japan has turned on defense. We've seen a second layout that happened at this point from uh, Kato. Yeah, he did that earlier as well. But that's, they need to maintain tight defense. They've been switching a lot as well right now. They need to... <laughs> you They're can hear so the close every time. <laughs> but this is where the game is going to happen. There's oh Kato my again. Goodness. Japan absolutely turning on the Jets. We're seeing, we're going into the sixth gear here. And Japan setting up the marks, putting on a lot harder marks, which is making things a lot tougher for these taller Australian players. And out to the sideline, that's the pressure that we needed. The Japanese defensive line throwing their bodies around, amping themselves up, creating this, this level of frantic, uh, franticness I don't know if that's a word but but it is in this sense Japan back on offense just outside the end zone oh unfortunate a little bit of being perhaps gas didn't create that upfield space so the Japanese cutter held up and it was a blind spot throw it's a it's a notorious throw for uh, creating those turnovers So Australia going to get another chance here. We'll see if Japan still has the gas to, to put on as much pressure as they have been in the past uh, earlier in this point. That's Aiden Smith, far sideline. Back to the middle. Lefty throw, O'Hagan, all on his own. Not sure where his defender is. A little bit of confusion with the Japanese D-line. There's a lot of players who aren't covered. But it looks like there's an injury call. Not too sure what's going on. I believe that was, that's Lock, Lochnan, Oliver Lochnan there taking a break. Oh, forgive me, sorry, it's Matthew Hanna. So we're going to sub in number 32. That's Tom Boyle to take a spot. Hopefully Australia can convert here. That's another shot out into the same spot. That point and is called. And that's inbounds. So number 20, Edmund Fang tracks that one down. It was tight. I think that would have been out of the hands of the handler that was streaking up line. So it was good that he was there to pick up the garbage. And that's great speed to go in and close on that uh, and, and save that point, essentially. Um, that's, that's a tough point for Team Japan. Uh, but you could see that the change that they did, they changed their speed. A lot of times as defense, you tend to play to the speed of the other team. But if you can change the gear you're playing at, then all of a sudden it changes the looks that are happening downfield. 
and you should not ever play consistently throughout a game. You need to be changing your strategy and responding. Uh, many teams, we see this when they're touring or they first start playing competitive, and even mid-level teams, they'll do an adjustment at half. But if you look at the elite teams, they will call timeouts to change strategy, even when they're on offense. Uh, San Francisco Fury was reliable for doing this. Uh, they would play three or four, Matty Sang would call a timeout, and then they would just change how they're playing offense and how they're playing defense. And that forced the other team to adapt. They could never quite figure it out. And that's what Team Japan has done here as well, is that that point and a few others, they've been changing how they've been playing defense. They've been leaving players open. But that means there's uncertainty for the Australian players. Are they really open? Is someone poaching? Because it didn't happen earlier in the game. Absolutely. So we were talking about this yesterday in the in the German Germany versus Canada game. Sometimes when a player is too open, you can't throw to them because you know that there's something hiding in the way. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, here we have Japan. They're deep in their own end zone. Australia putting on a lot of pressure here, but they're able to shake free. Japan on the far sideline. Oh, unfortunate, but Recovered. a Mac for yards. Shimizu, great focus there to pick that up. And a, a foul call, maybe a little bit of contact from Tom Boyle there. And that felt a lot of like players' momentums, and it seems like a contact that would happen naturally. Mm -hmm. Very spirited resolution. Japan really worked their way up up the full field very quickly, unlike how we've seen them previously in this game. Oh, and an inside shot picked up, and a nice grab. That was really quick, that inside throw. I don't think it was intended for that receiver, but a real Jedi catch. Uh, <laughs> was able to pick that up, and then he had the rest of the break side to throw out into space. Yeah, Kojima did eventually get that. That was the pass in the end zone. <laughs> I think it was intended for Kojima as well. Uh, but great movement upfield. We saw that a few points ago where they kind of moved out quickly. That was really close. There was almost a Callahan in mm -hmm. the end zone there. Uh, if there had been a layout, they could have gotten some contact on it. And there was almost a pickoff as well. So Japan really cutting it close there, but getting it out and then just breaking free, just going into this amazing flow downfield. We saw the Mac as well, so perhaps three potential chances on that point. So not clean, uh, but it converted. And Australia now in that late game stage where it's 13-11, momentum has kind of shifted and it's still anyone's game. Um, but if they focus in, they can really close this out. Absolutely, I think I think one of the things that we talk about a lot of a lot of the time in in Ultimate, it's that one game-changing play, the TSN turning point. But I think the the TSN turning point of this game may actually have been that full point that the Japanese D-line played when they were throwing their bodies around, a lot different than the sort of more focused quiet defense that they've been playing earlier and there's another layout d number 15 in australia nicholas hodgson looking for a sort of an inside out backhand to the far side of the field and picked off by a japanese defender right place right time nice layout throw great focus and japan's going to be on O again they have to work the full field and there's a bit of confusion and another layout D, unfortunate. He just didn't get enough of it. Yeah, the stack was not set up in the right spot, and they kept trying to shift it rather than try and get open. Um, Sheeta did manage to rescue it, but there was that Mac. Um, like, Australia is right there. Just needed to put a little bit more conviction, a little more gumption behind that layout D, but we now have a, a turnover, a bounce off the hands. So Australia is gonna be here right in the middle of the field, or sorry, Japan is gonna be, Austra oh my goodness, <laughs> Australia. They've set up their isolation cut and a break side, a little bit of a miscommunication on the force there, I think. Unfortunate for Japan, that layout D was incredible. Great shot, um, or great, great defense. A, a bit of a 
maybe not the best decision from Australia. I think he saw an open player and he thought what he wanted to do and it didn't quite come out maybe the best way that he could do it, but Australia able to, to hang on there and to uh, eventually score the goal. Yeah, that pass, if typically thrown as a backhand throw, needs to be a lot higher and aiming essentially towards the back cone of the end zone. Uh, that'll get it out to space, that'll take it out of any midfield player that might try and get a bit on it. Uh, it was just too low and too, uh, too much towards the front end of the end zone. Mm -hmm. uh, what we also saw in that Japanese line was a set of cutters handling. So that seemed to be uh, a line that typically wasn't used to handling together. Uh, and that might have been a chance for some of the other players who haven't been playing as much in this game to try and get an opportunity uh, to get on the field and build some plays in chemistry. What we did see was that their defense was fantastic. Yes. And so we're seeing, uh, we saw that might have been a chance to rest some legs as well as we go into this 14-11 position where Japan now needs to convert and then needs three plus breaks to win. So this is potential game point for Australia. They have to break to win. Unfortunately, the pull goes out of bounds. Japan putting on their typical offensive line. These are the handlers that they, they know their stuff. They've got a ton of confidence. They know how to work together. You can see them when they, when they catch, they're already throwing. They don't even have to look upfield. They know that they're going to have a player there. Uh, and, and Australia setting up in that classic three-person zone. But Japan, they have to be disciplined here. They have to swing it back and forth, do what they know, uh, instead of trying to force it through the middle because we have from Australia, O'Hagan in the middle, and we know he's going to get that layout block if they give him a chance to. The, the mid-cutters as well for Japan have backed off quite a bit. They're not trying to pop. They're going into the side, like the side swing spots. Uh, but they're not trying to come up through the middle. And on, on the contrary, we, we see the people in the middle right now. For example, number 20, that's Shimizu. He has th three, four Australian bodies in front of him. He's not really making himself a threat at all. If Japan wants to make Australia a little bit more uncomfortable, they're going to have to draw in the defenders uh, and really make them think about other pockets that are open on the field. Japan could also consider more passes immediately back to the thrower to try and get that cup to change direction quickly, burn that, burn those legs essentially in pushing back and forth, exhaust that cup. But they have made it almost <laughs> to the opposing brick mark. I was going to say from all the constructive criticism we, we've been giving them, they seem to know their <laughs> stuff. <laughs> There's a million different ways to play this game and that's part of what makes it amazing. It's true. It's very true. Australia now, they've transitioned out to their person defense. The Japanese handling uh, contingent still working it back and forth. It's a nice break throw and a layout D, but it looks like there was a little bit of contact. I think the the Japanese player there is that number, number 38, Nakahaka Mata. Uh, he uh, calling a foul on number 27, James Walker. I think that's a totally legitimate call. There was a little bit of contact. The disc was in his hands. So Japan is going to take possession. That's a nice swim cut there and picked up by 57. That's Kurahara into the end zone. Japan holds off Australia for one more point. We're 14-12. Aust the Australian O-line is going to go out. They're going to try and close out this game. Uh, but really impressive discipline from Japan there. I think working 60 yards before the Australian, uh, Australian team called off their zone and went to person defense. In that transition, Japan was very calm. They let Australia sort themselves out. They let their own cutters sort themselves out before they made any, any attack towards the end zone. That was yeah, well played. They did not try and actually put the pressure on. There may have been, no, there wasn't, maybe was not a timeout, was a timeout. Uh, saw something from the game advisors there talking about it. The body language for the Australians, they see they're on game point. 
it is different from what it was five, six points ago. They're much more confident. They're more relaxed. We're going to see probably better handling out of them. I hope <laughs> we do. Um, but they, they've put an incredibly tall line out there. And Japan has also put a line to match up against that. Uh, but we see the same sort of players out there, like Kato's out there. We've seen him laying out consistently. We're seeing Matsudo, so they've put the handle pressure. This is Japan's A-line, so pay attention if you're going to play them later on in the <laughs> tournament. These are the players that they think are the best. They also expected, it seems, that this would have gone out. They did not run hard right from the get-go. This is also a strategy you can have, is that we're intentionally going to put it out to, make, uh, to take the brick. Uh, that way you can set up a little bit better, you can analyze what the offense is also going to be working on. Shot into the middle, out to number 10, that's Angus Wicks. Quick throws, and a big shot to the end zone to a laying out player. Nicholas Hodgson, just outside of his hands, I think he was probably taking a peek at the line there too. He was very close to the back of the end zone. We've seen a few of those tonight, or this morning. <laughs> this morning. Maybe it's tonight somewhere for you folks watching at home, but a nice layout attempt by Australia. But this gives Japan another chance to try and keep themselves in the game uh, on this this game point. It's 14-12 for Australia right now, but Japan definitely has another shot to bring it within one. And a big throw. Is he going to get there? No, and there no. would have been a travel called on that as well. So that disc would have likely come back. Off-balance throw. It was, it was tough. It is, and, and a... You, you do see that, especially with flick throws, trying to generate more power uh, from the body. A lot of players have a tendency to fall back like that. Um, but unfortunately, just a little bit too much angle on that. And uh, going downwind, as we said before, it takes away some of the float uh, from those hucks. So now Australia is going to get another chance. And... <laughs> Another big throw. I think that's going to be good. We've got the huge, oh, <laughs> and a bobble and some change. But that's Pat Graham with the grab. An incredible throw as well. That was from number 32. Tom Boyle really showing his stuff. That's a really great throw. Lots of space. Gave, uh, you know, up high out of the reach of the Japanese defender. And so Australia is going to take this game 15 to 12 over Japan. That's an upset for you folks uh, and a really exciting game for us to watch. Absolutely. Great puts both ways. Uh, good ending as well. Uh, great defensive pressure there as well. The closing speed on the Japanese player had hung out. It was a good battle. It wasn't a clean catch from that perspective. And so we can expect a lot from both of these teams going on throughout the rest of the tournament. Absolutely. And we have another game coming up for you folks next. The next round is starting in about 15 minutes. That's 11 a.m. here Eastern time. So we're going to have a women's game. It's going to be Germany, uh, who we saw yesterday on the live stream facing off against Canada uh, versus Australia. So the Australian women's team is going to be taking the pitch uh, and we'll have a, a new new round at 11. You'll see some, some updates on our Twitter and our Facebook about scores in the other rounds coming up shortly as well. But thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you to these two teams, Australia and Japan, for an amazing sense of uh, sportsmanship uh, for the first round of the, the men's division here. Thank you Tushar for commentating alongside. Um, so I'm Naomi Redmond. Tushar Singh and uh, this is the World Junior Ultimate Championships brought to you on the showcase field by Cut Camps. Uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. See you in 15 minutes.